Hello, my name is Beck, and welcome to a September wrap up. I read nine books in September and as usual, I will link any reviews or vlogs and stuff down below in the description because I've done a couple of videos based around some of these books already. But without further ado, let's jump into the books that I have read this month. Let's chat about them. I read a lot of audiobooks this month. The first one is The Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Cowell. This is the first in her Lady Astronaut series and it follows a woman who is in like the 50s or 60s and she's with her husband and they are on like a kind of retreat and suddenly something strikes the earth it's literally a meteor and it's an alternate history kind of story and it follows these characters as they have to realize that the earth is starting to wither away because of the impact of this meteor and as a result they have to investigate space travel and try and find a way off earth and that involves astronauts and it's about this woman who is like a brilliant genius mathematician and her husband who works in the astronaut kind of area. I don't know what his job is. I don't remember. I know his name's Nathaniel though, so at least that stuck from reading the audiobook. The way that this was written, it was designed to make you angry and it did such a brilliant job. It was written through the lens of feminism and of racial segregation and it had wonderful female friendships and wonderful anxiety representation as well with the main character and her struggles and I adored this story and I gave it four and a half stars out of five and I can't wait to continue reading the series. I think Mary Robinette Cowell did such a clever and careful job of this book and I think that anyone reading that will appreciate it because I'm not usually into historical fiction stories and this was an alternate history book with like a sci-fi kind of element and the main character is definitely smarter than Mary Robinette Cowell in terms of mathematics. So to write a character that is smarter than you is probably its own challenge in and of itself. So I really respect the way that she did that and I really, really enjoyed it. So I would recommend it, especially if you like books with established couples in it already. It didn't set people up to fall into a romance during the course of the book. It actually had a really strong foundation of this couple and they didn't hold stuff back from each other in terms of miscommunication to make the plot go forward. They were very open with each other and very supporting, even in circumstances that were alarming. And I loved that about it. So big props to this book. I really enjoyed it. Like I said, four and a half out of five stars. Now the next book I actually read physically because I was lucky enough to get an early copy from the publisher, but it is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V. E. Schwab. And this is a standalone kind of urban fantasy, partly historical fiction book. It's hard to put into a genre. I don't think it's designed to shoehorn into a genre and that's part of the beauty of it. It follows a girl named Addie and I actually have a full review of this book so I will link that below like I said before and this has quickly become one of my favorites of all time just because of the way that the themes were so, I don't know, they rang true in this book and they were very open and honest and also raw and intriguing. Our main character Addie, she is in France in the 1700s and she is set up in this marriage that is natural for the time and is quite traditional but it's not something that she wants and so because she wants her own freedom, because she wants to explore, she summons the devil, makes a deal with him and he twists her deal. So he gives her immortality and the curse that nobody remembers her and that she can't leave a mark on anything and she can't say her own name. And I love the way that Victoria Schwab explored these themes of needing meaning in your life, of loneliness. The way that this is told is alternating timelines. So we get flashbacks of Addie in the past when she is learning about herself and the restrictions of this curse. And then also in present day in 2014. So Addie is 300 years old and the devil is the only like constant in her life. And that initially was pitched to me as being a romance because they were the only constants. But over that span of time and with an imbalanced power dynamic is not necessarily a healthy way to form a relationship. So it's an imbalance, but it's amazingly done and it's very complicated. And one day in 2014, Addie goes into a bookstore, runs into this guy named Henry and he remembers her. Why? That's the whole premise. So I adored this book. I adored the way that both of the characters in here are bisexual. I loved the way that the themes were so strong and I loved the way that V. E. Schwab took the time to sit on this idea when she had it because she had it a long time ago and only felt ready to write it when she was older. And I think that had a significance on me reading it because it felt more true. I don't know how to convey that in a more simpler way without you having read the book. So 
what I'm trying to say is just go read this book. It was a five out of five stars for me, if that wasn't already clear, and it's one of my new favorites of 2020. Next, I listened to another audiobook, and it's one of the Dresden Files. It is Death Masks, again, review linked below. I'm doing a whole spoiler-free review playlist of these books as I read them, so that will also be linked below. But this one, to describe the synopsis without spoilers in it, I believe this has an ancient relic in it. There is also a mysterious headless corpse that has appeared, and there's also vampire court politics that carry on from the prior books in the series that have been established so far. So without getting into the world building and the character building and development that have happened so far in here, I just want to say that I really quite enjoyed this, but it wasn't my favorite of the series that has happened so far. There are other books that I've given five out of five stars to, and this was just a four and a half out of five, but I still really enjoyed it. And the reason that I gave this a four and a half instead of a five was that unlike the other books, I found this very busy at the start and the other books have gripped me from the beginning right from the get-go but this one didn't quite like I was interested obviously otherwise I wouldn't have continued but the way that this started and it took like almost a third of the book to get me situated and fully fully invested and then the ending was awesome but it had a lot of stuff going on when usually with a Dresden book there is like a mystery there is a case that is not necessarily connected and there's a personal stake in it for Dresden and usually there's those three things that are happening in tandem to make the plot feel really fully action-packed but this had like five things happening instead of you know the three or four so it felt a little bit more busy and a little bit more fast compared to the other books and so because it was so quick I'm not complaining that it was so quick I love an action driven plot but it didn't give me enough of a chance like the previous books that I've loved to kind of sit with Dresden and feel the things that he was feeling it got towards the end and the middle and it let me feel those things but the start was a little bit too much because it was establishing everything in order to get to the middle and then to the end. I hope that makes sense but I have a full review for this so if you want more thoughts go and check that out but again four and a half out of five stars and obviously I've continued reading the Dresden Files because the next book that I read was Blood Rites on audiobook and this is I think book six of the Dresden Files. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, but I'm loving the series. I loved the fast-pacedness of this book. Is that even a word? But it can be now. I also love that family and faith were key parts of this as well, and I gave it five out of five stars. I've seen comments saying that this, or this was assumed not to be one of my favorites or a book that I'd give five stars, but I really loved it. I don't know if that's the popular thing about this series, but I gave it five stars, so let me know what you rated it down below. Next, I read another audiobook, and this is actually an Audible original, and it's by Mary Robinette Cole, who wrote The Calculating Stars, and it's also by Brandon Sanderson, one of my favorite authors, and they actually do a podcast called Writing Excuses that I really love, and they have come together in a creative project, and it is a sci-fi novella, and it's only this one, it's only the original, and I hesitate to describe too much of the premise because it's so short but there are preview chapters on Brandon's YouTube channel so I'll link those as well but it's about a woman who wakes up and she only realizes that she's woken up because she's in this very unique situation where she is a clone and the reasons of her becoming a clone are not quite clear she only knows that she has to track down her previous self and kill her so that is the premise of this book and it really developed the world building in such a small space of time. I think it really focused on Brandon's significant world building capabilities and also Mary Robinette Cowell's characterization abilities because that's something I found so strong with her Calculating Stars book, the way that she developed her character's perspective and the way that character saw the world. And that was very much prevalent in the original as well. And the way that the character experienced the world was the way that Brandon could write the world. I don't know. I'm not really entirely sure how I'm trying to convey the description of what I enjoyed, but those two authors combining their strengths was just excellent. The thing that let me down a little bit for the book was that the sound effects tended to overpower the book in certain parts and I wanted to enjoy the story rather than be overwhelmed by music or sound effects. And then the ending seemed fairly quick and I can understand why if you had to wrap it up in a novella, but I, I wanted just a little bit more from the ending, but it was a decent ending. So I gave it four out of five stars and I enjoyed it. Next up, I read a book that's been on my TBR for a little while. I got it at the start of the year, I believe, and it's Malice by John Gwynne. This is the first book in an adult high fantasy series called The Fateful and the Fallen, and it deals with multiple perspective characters. There is a god war that is 
on the cusps of occurring and there are magical creatures in here like giants. So if you want a book series that is driven by narration and plot rather than deep characters, then I'd suggest going into this. But I spoke about this a lot in a vlog and the reason that I didn't really love this as much as I thought I would was a significant chunk of this book, if not all of it, was set up. And then the characters that we followed, there was like seven of them introduced in the first 60 pages. So because of the way that it kept flitting perspectives and because of the way that it leaned really heavily into fantasy tropes, it made it less surprising to me and more inevitable because I love fantasy tropes. But the way that this did it, it didn't push at the boundaries of them and it didn't subvert them to the extent that I was necessarily hoping it would. So that's why I only gave this a three out of five stars. The main character in here that we follow is Corbin and he is that typical, you know, farm boy. He's in a village and he's being trained by this sword master named Gar. So already you've got the isolated farm boy who is going through a training montage with a old mentor. So those are things I love about a book. And I believe that Corbin is being set up to be the chosen one because that's necessarily the way that the story was going. They also had an animal familiar in here, which is a trope that I'm obsessed with after reading and loving the Robin Hobb books, especially the Farseer trilogy. So it had pieces that I loved and it had potential, but certain things that happened to other characters I saw coming because of the trope aspect of this. And I've heard that it gets better with the next books in the series, but at this point, I don't plan on continuing because this was over 600 pages. And if I'm going to invest my time in a book that's over 600 pages, I at least want to give it a four stars or higher. And I only gave this a three. So as far as this series goes, I am stopping here, but I did enjoy it enough. And it's not a bad book by any means. I want to make that clear. It's just a book that I didn't vibe with, I guess. So if you like plot books and if you like large scale fantasy worlds, then I think you'll like this. And I thought I would too, but it just so happened that I didn't. So only a three out of five stars from me. If you can hear noise in the background, it's lockdown, it's quarantine, everyone is at home. So I do apologize. But the next book on my list is Nixia by Scott Rainton. And this is a sci-fi, but I thought it would be adult and it was actually YA. Not that that isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just means that my expectations were already misaligned. And in addition to that, I got this more than three years ago. So I was definitely drawn to this by the cover because first of all, look how awesome this is. But the premise is like, survivor but in space and it pits all these minority kids against each other in order for them to I guess win and get onto this planet so that they're paid an exorbitant amount of money to mine this new substance called Nixia. So we follow this character named Emmett and he is a young black kid who is going on this trip with everybody else. He's from quite a poor neighborhood so this prize money will pay so well for him. And there are other kids from other minorities who are in similar positions to him. So he is being trained alongside them. And the reason that their kids being sent into space is because the aliens that are on this planet that they need to mine the Nixia from revere children. They kind of find them almost godly. So that's why the kids are going into space and not the adults like you'd expect. So it's like a YA survivor in space and they go through rigorous training and all that kind of thing. I didn't get too far into it because I DNF'd this at 75 pages and just the way that it was written in certain aspects, it seemed a little bit cheesy to me. Like the character was like, A is for angry and I was angry, you know, stuff like that. I'm not necessarily saying that that's a bad thing, but when I'm reading it, that kind of writing takes me out of a story. So I'm a little bit more picky now when it comes to YA that I read. And I think this just missed the boat for me. I think if I read it several years ago when I bought it, I would have enjoyed it. But now that my reading tastes have grown and shifted and I've aged, that this wasn't quite right for me. So I'm probably going to unhaul this after I finish filming this reading wrap up, to be honest, but that doesn't mean it's a bad book. It just means that it didn't quite fit me. Next, I read an audiobook called The Trouble with Peace by Joe Abercrombie. And this is the second book in his Age of Madness series. The first one in this series is called A Little Hatred. And this is one of his next installments also in his first law series. So if you want to understand kind of the gist of the first law world I will link down below an interview that he did with Murphy on her channel because he described it at the beginning of that interview in a very succinct manner that I'm not going to be able to emulate but I would just say read the first law 
books in order of publication and then read the Age of Madness books because you can enter technically wherever you want to, but there are characters that show up, there are references made, and those references inform such deep character things about who you're reading from that if you miss them, it would take something away from the story. So it is feasible to start not from the beginning, but I would recommend starting from the beginning. But anyway, The Trouble with Peace is going to be really hard to describe, so I'm just going to read this out really quickly. It is conspiracy, betrayal, rebellion. Peace is just another kind of battlefield. So we're in the first little world, like I said, and we follow a couple of perspective characters, which I'll get into in a second, but this is in an industrial revolution phase, so it's quite different to the wars that we went through at the start of the scope of this series and this world has grown now that the characters have either grown, aged, died or are older and I love that because it's not just developing the characters, it's developing the scope of the world as well and all the politics that come with that and all of the families that come with that as well. So that lets me get into the kind of characters in here. One of them is named Savine and she is high up in politics, she's a powerful investor that has mines and factories that have made her quite wealthy from a lot of business deals. She has some uh, deeper, darker stuff to grapple with after the events of the first book, but I won't get into that. And instead, I'm going to talk about Rika, who is another character that is a perspective character. And both of these characters are offspring of characters in the first law books. So I don't want to say surnames. I don't want to talk about family. I'm just going to say their first names and that's it, because if you look up anything else, it will spoil who they are related to. In this book, Rika has the the power of the long eye. I mean, she had that in the first book as well, but this enables her to see glimpses of the future, but this ability is slowly killing her. So she has to master it before it kills her, basically. What I love about Abercrombie's writing is that it is so deeply informed when it comes to character and it is always so distinct with who you're reading from because the way that Malice is written is very different to the way that Joe Abercrombie writes. I didn't connect with Malice as much but I connected with The Trouble with Peace because the way that Joe Abercrombie writes he alters the way narration is depending on who you're reading from. So if you're reading from somebody who's a scholar, he will use longer sentences. He will use more extravagant words. If you're reading from somebody who is just a soldier or a gutter rat, he will use shorter sentences. He will use terms that are more relatable to their particular situation. So he really situates you in his particular character's head and vision. So you can get a proper grapple on the world that he's building up. And when I was reading a synopsis, like a recap of A Little Hatred, because I read it in January, so I didn't remember all the intricacies to go into the sequel. When I was reading that, I was like, who is this again? What did they do? Who are they? Only because I connect with the character's perspective and the context of them rather than always their name. And because I like reading high fantasy on audiobook, sometimes I forget their name if it's not seen written in front of me and I don't write it down in my notes because it's high fantasy and there's a lot of stuff to focus on. But as soon as I was listening to this audiobook and Stephen Pacey's narration, I was straight back into everybody's heads. And I love that I focused on these characters so much and the politics around them was kind of like a peripheral thing that was also going on. So that's why I struggle to sum up these books often because I don't focus on the politics, I focus on the characters. If you want a book series that is brilliantly written in terms of characters and it does have a plot involved, but it is deeply informed by those characters doing things, I would recommend reading Joe Abercrombie because he's absolutely wonderful. And I gave this book a five out of five stars. I read it during a reading vlog, so I'll link that below. But I said in that vlog that I was thinking of giving it a four and a half instead of a five. But there were moments that I was like, oof. And then there are other moments where I was like, do do do, like listening to parts of politics. So I wasn't sure, but because it balanced out so well and because he wrote his characters so well, I can't give it less than a five stars, I think. So it's going to be a five stars from me. And then next I listened to another audiobook. Well, I kind of listened to it. I listened to Nosferatu by Joe Joe Hill? Yes, I almost said Joe Abercrombie. I listened to Nosferatu by Joe Hill and I DNF'd it after 20% in because the story wasn't quite what I was after. So we follow this girl in the story named Vic and she from a very young age has this ability to ride her bike on a bridge in the cognitive realm and that bridge is like a shortcut between wherever her destination wants it to be. So she can ride it between states and stuff. But the thing is whenever she does that it 
pierces her eye in like a headache kind of scenario. It gives her fevers, it makes her ill. And after doing this a few times and then growing up to about 17, she kind of dismisses these things as just childhood fantasy until it happens again during her 17 years of age scenario. And her story is told in juxtaposition with this guy who also uses the cognitive realm, except instead of a bike, he uses a car like a Rolls Royce. And he is actually a pedophile and a serial killer. And he kidnaps children and feeds off them. It's kind of a similar formula to Joe Hill's dad uh, that he used in It. So that monster feeds off children and haunts them, basically. This is kind of a similar thing, but in more of a serial killer aspect that is actually a person but is immortalized because of the power that he's consuming and like I said I got 20% in but the reason I DNF'd it is not entirely clear to me there was just some kind of disconnect between me and reading it I think because the character of Vic was so unlikable and the way that Joe Hill wrote her as a woman I don't know if it was intentional I think it was intentional the way that he wrote her as hating herself and hating other women but uh, there's only so much of that I can take. If it informs the entirety of her character, then I'm not as interested. And I don't think that was the only reason. I think it was just the plot was not as interesting to me. But I am listening currently to Horns by Joe Hill. And that is my current read. So I'm liking this a little bit more only because it's told consistently through one character's viewpoint. And it's about a mystery of solving a murder rather than like a cat and mouse kind of game. So... I don't know how to really explain the intricacies of why I didn't love Nosferatu that much, given that the title is like the name for vampire, which is kind of what drew me to the book in the first place. The serial killer character like sucks the life out of people and that's why he's called Nosferatu. But eh, it just didn't do it for me. So like I said, I stopped reading it. Hello, editing Beck here because I realized that before I talk about the last book that I read in September, I missed talking about another Dresden book. They all kind of blended together because I read them so closely to each other. But the book that I read was Deadbeat and I gave this five out of five stars and this deals with Harry Dresden encountering necromancers and it actually, I timed this accidentally quite well because Harry Dresden's birthday in the books is on Halloween and I read this just as we were coming into October. So we deal with necromancers on the cusp of Halloween wanting to re-summon Kemla, who is this big, bad, like, fey kind of force of nature that will empower whoever summons him. So that's kind of what this book follows, as well as Dresden getting blackmailed by one of the vampires. So it's still got vampire politics interwoven, but the beauty about Dresden is that in the series, there are different aspects to each supernatural nasty that he encounters. So in Full Moon, the second book, there are werewolves in it, but there are multiple types of werewolves. So in the later books and in the concurring books are vampires, and there's the Red Court, the White Court, the Black Court, and even mentioned by one character of the Jade Court in another country. So it's just cool to see the different kinds of vampires and to see some recurring characters from the different courts. So that is, without spoilers, what is part of Deadbeat. But like I said, I gave this five out of five stars. I loved the new dynamics in this book. I, of course, loved the trauma that Dresden encountered in this book based on past things that have occurred in the plot, obviously. I'm not going to spoil what it is, but yes, to end this little segue in the reading wrap up that I'm filming, I loved Deadbeat and I am very much looking forward to continuing with the next book. So five out of five stars and back to past Beck. And then the last book that I finished this month was quite different to everything that I'd read so far because it's a middle grade and that is Hollowpox by Jessica Townsend. This came out on the 29th of September and it was kindly sent to me by Hachette so thank you very much to them for sending it to me. I also pre-ordered the physical copy and then panicked because I didn't think the physical copy would arrive on time and so I pre-ordered the ebook because I wanted to read it and then the publisher sent me a copy early so I accidentally ended up with three copies of this book but I have no regrets because it was delightful. This is about Morrigan Crow and when she was 11 years old she was in a family that didn't really like her. I think they kind of hated her. They blamed her for everything and she was convinced that she was cursed. They were convinced she was cursed so she got blamed for every wrong thing that happened in their town and she had to apologize to everybody who had been personally wronged by something even if it 
obviously wasn't her fault. So she got whisked away by Jupiter North. They went through like a portal into a different realm called Nevermore. And in the first book, it has a bunch of trials it's called the Trials of Morrigan Crow. In the second book, it's about a magical school. And in this book, it actually is very topical because it's about a pandemic that is affecting all of the animals, which are like wondrous animals in this world. So the wondrous animals are creatures that are animals but personified. So they are basically like real people. And the themes that Jessica Townsend explored in here was racial segregation and racism through the lens of characters of Nevermore against the animals for this particular virus because the virus is only affecting the creatures of their society and not the people who are human. So it has a whole mob mentality towards these animals and these people who shouldn't be deemed part of society but are obviously part of society and deserve as many rights as the humans. So I loved that that was a theme in this book and it was done so well and it was obviously causing outrage with Morrigan and a few of her friends and it built such disparity between characters that we thought we could respect and it was surprising when they said things that weren't actually that respectful. So I like how it delved into that detail and how it was really hard to separate right and wrong when right and wrong can be so subjective. But all of that said, the beginning of the book, it took me like 112 maybe 150 pages to get into this because it was setting up so much stuff from the beginning because this is about Morrigan learning more how to be a wondersmith and learning the wondrous arts but it didn't really get into the holopox dilemma until a little bit further into the book once that had been established. So it took a little bit of time for that plotline to establish and it seemed quite not frantic, but just quite busy, I guess, with other stuff happening. But I love Morrigan's friends. I love her found family. I love Jupiter and how he's kind of like Dumbledore in Harry Potter, except instead of all the toxicity and crypticness of Dumbledore, he's actually very wholesome. And even though he's working and not always necessarily present, he always listens to her and he always pays her attention and he never undermines her or anything, but he also enforces the fact that he is an adult and she is a child. So sometimes what she's saying can just be silly and he recognizes that and other times she says things which have actual merit, which he also recognizes. So I like that there are healthy relationships in here in terms of friend dynamics and support and family and like a father figure mentor. I just love all of the relationships in here. I think Jessica Townsend balances them very, very well. And I loved the plot of this more towards the middle and end rather than the start. So because of that, I'm going to give it a four out of five stars. But I find this series absolutely delightful and it's such a joy to read. So if you haven't picked up Nevermore yet, try not to go in with like overhyped expectations. Just expect something fun and you will enjoy yourself because this was such a delightful read and I'm really glad that I got to pick it up when it released or just before it released. So go and get it now. It is out because it came out on the 29th. So that is the last book in this reading wrap up. So these are all the books that I read in September. I am surprising myself by reading so many more books per month than usual. I think my reading slump is pretty much gone now because if this is any indication, then it's got to be gone, right? But let me know down below if you have read any of these books. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will chat to you down in the comments and I'll catch you in my next video. Bye.